All right, it sounds like we're good to go. Everyone can hear me just fine. Perfect. All right, so I will call this meeting to order. Um, moving forward, so first and foremost, we've got item two, the approval of minutes from last month's meeting. Um, is there any comments to be made on that or any changes? Nope. All right, can we get someone to move forward the minutes then? I'll move, I'll move the minutes. Oh, <clears throat> sorry, Rebecca. All right. Okay. Thank you, okay. Councillor Kent. And can we, uh, Paul, would you like to second that? I will second. Perfect, thank you. All right, so the approval of minutes moves forward. Um, item three, approval of the order of business. Now, I think in correspondence, we had a request to move item 8.1.1, uh, the Shannon Park Act of Transportation update. Uh, we had a request to move that ahead of item seven, just due to time constraints due to our presenters. I'm not sure if I'm able to put that motion forward or if I need someone else to put that forward. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, somebody else should move the motion to approve the agenda as amended and this requires you second as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so if I could get someone to move that. I can. Thank you, Miles. And if I could get a seconder on that. I'll second. Thank you, Peter. All right, so we will move item 8.1.1, the Shannon Park Act of Transportation update ahead of item seven. And we'll follow up from there. Are there any other um, order of businesses that we want changed or are we good to move forward with that? I wonder, yes, Paul? I have, um, I just wondered if I might, uh, and I don't even know, it might be just uh, possible to do it in a round table or something. But I wanted just to provide a brief comment on uh, Councillor Sam Austin's uh, motion at uh, Council last Tuesday for a park uh, stewardship uh, report from staff. And as part of our HRM Alliance, uh, my group that's part of the Halifax Regional Trails Association um, has uh, put forward a proposal where we want uh, stewardship to be integrated uh, as part of the regional plan review. And I just thought I would just introduce uh, very briefly, probably less than five minutes, the ideas and concepts that we're dealing with uh, to the uh, to the standing committee here. But if I need to wait till next meeting or whatever, I'm fine to do that as well. Um, could I get a little bit of clarification on if that's something we could move forward with this meeting or if uh, there's a process to get that into uh, the active transportation discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, so you, you to the committee members, so it seems like that sounds like uh, a potential added item, uh, but in order to do so, unanimous consent is required by right now, not if all the members of committee are not in the meeting as of now, so uh, if the committee doesn't mind to discuss on that at the next meeting, uh, that would be the best way to go forward. All right, perfect. So would that be a motion we put forward to discuss at the next meeting? Uh, motion is not required, so please just okay. contact Liam Power and he will be able to help you to add that on the agenda for next meeting. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the clarification on that. Um, are there any other uh, order of businesses that we want to defer or add a comment on today? No. All right. Then I will look for someone to move forward the order of business. Aye. Thank you, Andrew. And a seconder? I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Kent. All right, moving forward. Um, uh, excuse item me. Four. Oh, sorry. Excuse yeah. me. Uh, so the question has to be called. So do you mind uh, asking the committee members if they Agree uh, on the motion or not by asking oh, yeah. Sorry your about name? That. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get used to it soon enough. So if I could get everyone uh, to say aye right now, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Perfect. Are there any nays? All right, perfect. Now moving forward. So item four, business arising out of the minutes. We have none on that. Um, item five, call for, call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts of interest that must be brought forward for today? I'm hearing none. All right, we will move forward. Um, item six, consideration of deferred business. I have none on the agenda. And that brings us forward to item 8.1.1, which was moved ahead of item seven, the Shannon Park active, active transportation updates. I will pass it along to our presenters to take over. Good, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dean McDougall. Um, I have a short presentation. There we go. Thank you, Haruka. Great. Um, so thanks for having me. I said my name is Dean McDougall, and uh, I'm here to give a brief uh, presentation on the Shannon Park uh, planning application we have uh, with the current planning. Uh, this application is uh, known as Case 22734, and it's a request to enter into a development agreement to uh, permit the redevelopment of the former Shannon Park lands in North, Dar North Dartmouth. So next slide, please. The applicant is WSP Global Inc. on behalf of uh, Canada Lands Company, who is the uh, property owner. And as I mentioned, it's uh, the former Shannon Park lands in Dartmouth. Um, and the proposal is to allow the creation of a mixed use community of approximately 7,000 residents. Uh, next slide, please. So the subject site is located uh, in North Dartmouth at the base of the McKay Bridge. It's located on the coast uh, with the Bedford Institute of Oceanography on one side and then Millbrook First Nation and Tufts Cove Generation Station uh, on the other. Next slide, please. Canada Land's uh, proposal includes 26 new city blocks, approximately 7,000 residents housed in a range of building forms and approximately 145,000 square feet of commercial space, approximately 15.5 acres of public park space, shown in, in green on the, on the image. And it will also include new public streets, uh, municipal services such as water and sewer, and a new transit facility. Now this concept plan and other review materials uh, that go into greater detail on the proposal are available on the application webpage, so I encourage you to, uh, to look at that. Uh, next slide, please. Now the development agreement, it's going to provide the conceptual approval of the uh, proposed development with the detailed design and specifics happening later at the subdivision and permitting stage. So the development agreement is meant to be high level in that it will identify the location of the roads, uh, the parks and new lots, uh, provide provisions for the subdivision of the land. It will identify the zones and through that the per permitted uses. It will set the maximum building heights uh, and it will set specific built form and land use requirements such as uh, building setbacks and uh, outline the phasing uh, for the development. Next slide, please. So an item of a specific interest to this group would be the proposed active transportation links and connection. So the evaluation criteria for this application requires that uh, Canalands their proposal include multi-use trails uh, through the site that link to potential and planned multi-use trail routes located on uh, Windmill Road, Baffin Boulevard, which is now uh, Hudson Way, and uh, near the McKay Bridge. So shown in the red dash line are the proposed on-street AT routes, and in the blue dash line would be the off-street AT routes, uh, with connection shown to uh, any potential routes that might happen with the redevelopment uh, and development of the Millbrook First Nation lands, lands uh, which are in gray uh, on this application or on, on that image rather, sorry. So with this proposed network, you'll be able to navigate the site north to south, east to west through multiple uh, pedestrian friendly options. And next slide, please. So to encourage cycling as a viable option to access uh, the development, a main route has been identified within the development to serve the, as a spine that supports active transportation throughout the whole site. 
Now this proposed route is shown in the green dash line in the image on your screen. And this route also aligns with the proposed transit route uh, through the site uh, that will link up with the proposed transit hub and windmill road, which is identified as a candidate route for a bike lane or paved shoulder in the AT uh, priorities plan. Next slide, please. So in terms of the planning process and where it is in the application process, uh, we've recently concluded the public engagement and are currently analyzing all the feedback received. Uh, from this will be further plan revisions and refinement based on the feedback we received from the public, as well as any outstanding items from the internal review that was completed earlier. Uh, from there, we'll negotiate the development agreement, uh, write a staff report and make our way to community council for their decision on the application. So next slide, please. So that's that's a small little short presentation I have prepared. Uh, I have my contact information there, and uh, there's a link to the application webpage where you can find the studies and further information on it. But uh, with that, I'll, I'll thank you and pass it back to you, uh, Mr. Chair, and take on any questions or clarification that you'd like. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any questions myself, but I will open it up to the rest of the committee if there's anyone that wants to just raise their hand or unmute their microphone and ask questions. Hi, uh, excuse me, Vice Chair, if I oh, may. Sorry. I just yeah. wanted to let everyone know that Chair had just joined. So Hugh, if you are ready, uh, yeah. you can lead the meeting. Thank you, Haruka, and uh, hello everyone. And my apologies again. Uh, my computer just completely packed up, so I'm now on the phone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, thank you again, uh, Dean, for your presentation. And um, I'm just going to go through the list um, of attendees. I, I think, uh, I'm assuming everyone is in attendance. Um, and just ask if you have any questions or comments for Dean. So Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Ehsan, do you have a question or comment? Mr. Chair, Muhammad is not in the meeting. I'm sorry, Haru. Oh, there you go. Muhammad, question or comment? Oh, that's Peter. Alison uh, Carlisle. Carlisle, question or comment? I do have a question. Um, you outlined the kind of location of that where the bike lane um, is going to be the bike infrastructure is that specifically going to be like AAA all ages and abilities cycling infrastructure or is that later in the process like is there a commitment to that hi sure um there isn't well you're right it is later in the process where we get to specifics about um, what that infrastructure will be, paved, separated bike lanes. But to answer the AAA, uh, according to, um, so the AAA network isn't proposed to reach this far. Windmill Road is the only one that's identified as Canada Route, and, I, and, I, and the, uh, the priorities plan lists that as a uh, paved shoulder, uh, just a bike lane. So the, the AAA um, wasn't reaching this far. So it's not proposed to be part of the AAA network. At this point in time, but as things change and develop, it possibly. But right now, it's it's just identified as windmill would be the only connector to the rest of the network, and it's proposed to be just a a, a paved shoulder bike lane. Okay, so when you're talking about this infrastructure, it's possible that when you do get to that stage in the process, it could even just be paved shoulder is the is right. the thing here. Okay, interesting. Could I, Mr. Chair, David McIsaac here from the AT Group? Could I have a quick comment? Hello, David. Uh, do you have a question or comment? Go ahead. Just so you know, we, I guess we've been advising, it's been a while since I think the, the Active Transportation Group ha has advised on the project, but I think we would be suggesting that uh, they, they put in, you know, as part of this development, uh, the more modern type of bicycle facility, which would be AAA. Um, so again, that's later in the process, but I guess just uh, for the committee's information, that would be kind of the the recommendation probably coming from, from our group and, and from the design group. Okay, that's good news, David. Thank you. Um, okay, with that, Alison? 
Yeah, thanks for um, clarifying that, David. And it seems that if that many people are going in there with both residential and commercial um, destinations, it would be good to, to get some AAA infrastructure there. So thank you. And I might, sorry, I'm gonna, Mr. Chair, if I just, one other quick comment is that uh, Dean doesn't get access to a lot of this transportation stuff, that, that the bigger picture, but, but uh, there is on the books to do a kind of a larger functional plan of Windmill Road itself. Um, so right now it's identified in the AT plan as a candidate bike route, but again, what would actually get built on Can Windmill Road is, is, you know, it's still very early days, uh, you know, for that. And, uh, so, um, again, but helpfully hear that comment and, and, uh, and again, you know, I think we'd be looking for AAA facilities everywhere in the municipality kind of going forward. Okay, um, so um, I'll continue down the list. Peter Zimmer, do you have questions or comments? Um, I just looked at that and I'm wondering about uh, in the opposition to uh, active transportation is motorized vehicles. I'm wondering if in the overall planning there's any view to uh, reducing or controlling parking facilities, the, you know, to encourage it seems to be a fairly dense sort of development. I'm wondering if uh, it's going to be designed as a walkable community with uh, grocery stores and other such uh, necessary amenities and uh, by design a kind of uh, restriction on giving in to the cars. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the zoning is intended to be mixed use, meaning there'd be commercial on the ground floor. Now the commercial uses permitted would allow for grocery stores and it'd be, we wouldn't be getting into that detailed. So how it will happen is that uh, Canada lands put in the infrastructure, the roads, the parks, and then they sell the lots off to individual uh, developers to, to build their buildings. So it will be largely dictated by the market, but with this population, it's, it's pretty safe to assume a grocery store would be put be placed in that area at, at full build out. Uh, and in terms of the pedestrian friendly, so every street proposed is proposed to have two sidewalks uh, on either side, in addition to um, any other active transportation infrastructure that, that we negotiate through the, the development agreement that should be located there. Uh, there is on street parking proposed at this point in time, but uh, in terms of like surface parking, that, that's not permitted under the, this will be followed. So when developed, when they go for their permits, it'll be following the center plan rules. Uh, which prohibits uh, surface parking largely. So it's, those type of developments wouldn't be permitted. So any parking would have to be underground uh, on individual lots, if, if that's what your, uh, your question was getting at. Okay, Peter. Um, yes. So we'll carry on. Uh, Elizabeth um, Pugh, are you here? I am, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I'm curious about the decision to put the bike lanes on the transit routes. Um, obviously, you want to have your hub hooking up to the biking, but I would have thought it would be a lot more pleasant for the cyclists to be on a, in a different place, and it might be easier for your bus stop management as well. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great comment. We'll uh, circle back with their active transportation group to get their feedback on that as well. But that, that's, that's currently proposed by the, uh, by the applicant, that route. Okay. Okay, Elizabeth? Yeah, as long as it's thought of, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Milena Kasnavicius, are you here? I am here. Um, I, don't, I don't really have a question, but um, from a perspective of a person who's completely blind, Dean, I'm happy to hear that there will be sidewalks on both sides where the pro proposal is that way to be. And uh, I do ask for consideration that um, straight crossings for all major intersections, no diagonals as in our old peninsula HRM because they're dangerous and annoying and highly frustrating for people who cannot see. That's my only comment. Thank you, end of thought. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Milena. Is Paul Berry here? Yes, I am. I just okay. had uh, one uh, maybe question. 
I know in terms of the Halifax Regional Trails Association in the past with these types of trails built by developers and stuff, the standards of the trails have kind of been not the, the greatest. What is the city going to do to ensure, uh, you know, the quality of the construction of the trails that they don't deteriorate within a year or two of their construction, things like that? I, uh, the majority of the trails will be on what is anticipated to be public parkland. So it would be taken over by our, our HRM for ownership. Um, there would be uh, a, a a warranty period for construction like there is with streets where if anything happens it's still on on the app the uh the developer to fix it but after that warranty period it'd be on the municipality it's part of our operations uh to to fix and, and maintain um and then anything outside of uh that's what that would be on private property uh if it's part of the network that's proposed uh we'd work collaborate with our our uh, active transportation team and parks teams to ensure that what's proposed in terms of design meets our specs and and that, it, that it's acceptable, so. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Miles McCormick, do you have questions or concerns? No questions, here. Okay, thank you, Miles. Uh, Ashley Boas. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just a quick thing, slightly not super AT related, but is, is there plans like within this and within the zoning for like affordable housing and like aging in place in a more kind of senior friendly um, neighborhood? Uh, in terms of zoning, the the, the senior friendly, I I have to double check what's proposed right now. Proposed is, is center two for the large for, uh, portion of the of the uh, site, which is pretty much anything goes for the zoning. If you look at the the permitted uh, land use uh, uh, uses there and under the current center plan, I do believe a senior uh, complex or, or some form of it would be permitted. In terms of the how affordable housing, uh, it, it would be subject to the density bonusing, incentive bonusing that's currently in place under the regional center through package A. So any development uh, site specific on it would have to provide cash to the municipality uh, for the affordable housing fund. Now it may not directly go into Shannon Park, um, That would, but, it's a, but we would be receiving money. There isn't any, uh, legislative requirement for them to put affordable housing in Shannon Park. Uh, the best we can do we require from them is to put money into the fund and then uh, as a city allocate the, the funds as, as we see fit, so. Okay, thanks. Um, and also is there, I mean, yeah, if it connects to the windmill road, bike, infrastructure, whatever that, that will hopefully look like in a safe kind of way um, when, when that sort of, redone but is there any other methods of getting in out you've got the bus there's you know obviously driving i mean we're right under the mckay bridge is there because that's not near where the proposed ferry thing is is it or uh recently yes a, a ferry it was a, like a ferry location terminal was identified um in in the shannon park area uh under the rapid transit st uh, strategy uh but if the coastline um the Canada Land Zones actually uh, just a little bit of coastline in this area, um, and it is going to be proposed to be part of the parkland. Um, Millbrook First Nation has the, the remaining part of the coastline, and then it's Nova Scotia Power. Uh, so uh, through the rapid transit strategy, you know, staff will continue to work with the property owners in the area to um, figure out how we can incorporate a ferry service here in the future as the city grows and changes. But it's not directly part of uh, the Shannon Park Proposal Development Agreement. But outside of that, it would be through, um, in, ways to get in and out would be through cars, walking, cycling, uh, and transit. Great, thank you. Okay, Dean, thank you. Um, and thank you, Ashley. Uh, Councillor Kent, do you have questions or concerns? No, not today, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Douglas Wetmore? No, nothing from me, Hugh. Thank you. Okay, that leaves me. And, and I, I just have a, a question, actually, going back to the, the earlier one. Um, although the, a, a high-speed ferry would certainly be good for uh, cyclists to get downtown, is there any, has there been any consideration of a cycle route on the McKay Bridge or its successor bridge? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, that, that is 
not in my wheelhouse. I, I don't know of any future plans. Perhaps if there's anyone here uh, from Act Transportation staff or that may know an answer, but I, I'm sorry, I don't know of any future plans for, for McKay okay. Bridge bike lane. Yeah, and it's probably Mr. most- Chair? Oh, yes, go ahead. That I know. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, the Halifax Harbor Bridge is the Bridge Commission is looking at an option to replace the McKay Bridge. Uh, its lifespan is coming to an end, and uh, and uh, they've been in touch with us to talk about that. And you know, and definitely, you know, what we've said is is if you're going to rebuild it, uh, it would need pedestrian facilities and bike facilities. And you know, a little bit of what we have looked at in 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 this Shannon Park plan is potentially how that access could happen, but it's kind of early days to to kind of figure that out. But uh, if, uh, if and when uh, the bridge, the McKay Bridge gets rebuilt or replaced, uh, I think it's fairly certain that there will be active transportation facilities on it. That's very good news. Uh, tantalizing. <laughs> okay, so uh, if there are no further questions for Dean, I'd like to thank him for his presentation. And uh, it sounds like you'll be back perhaps at a future time with uh, more detailed plans. Is that correct? Uh, to this committee, uh, unfortunately not. No, the, the next step would be, um, the next public process would be the public hearing at the Harbor East Marine Drive Community Council where the development agreement will be uh, in front of them for their decision. I see, okay, thank you. All right, well, uh, that's the end of uh, uh, the Shannon Park um, item, and we will now revert to the original uh, agenda, uh, which, and I believe that puts us at uh, item seven, correspondence, petitions, and delegations. Is that correct, Haruka? Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. So, um, Haruka, have there been any, is it, has there been any correspondence received? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So there has been one correspondence received from the today's uh, presenter, uh, Barry Smith from the Bike Keep, which is uh, which Barry is going to present after this item. Uh, okay, so I didn't catch all of that. I'm sorry. Could you could you repeat sorry, that, sorry, Mr. Chair? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Pretty well, yes, I can I can hear, yes. Uh, thank you. So there has been one one correspondence uh, from yeah. Barry Smith from Baikip, uh, who is the presenter for today, uh, which is oh, I am yeah. 7.3. Yes, I understand, sorry, my mistake. Uh, okay, very good. And uh, then item 7.2, um, have there been any petitions received? Nothing from the clerk's office. Okay. And um, committee members, uh, are there any petitions you wish to bring forward? Hearing none, I don't hear any. We'll move on to item 7.3, uh, the Bikeep Micro Mobility Solutions presentation. Um, and I'll invite Barry Smith and Jones Linda to uh, proceed with their presentation, please. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Jones Lindner here. Um, uh, Barry and I have been speaking uh, for a few weeks now about the potential of bringing Bike Keep here to Halifax. Uh, I am the account executive for the Americas for Bike Keep. Uh, as Barry and I be begun our conversations, I, I agreed I'd give you guys a, a brief presentation on an overview of what Bike Keep is and how it may um, align with what the goals are of the Active Transportation Committee. Uh, once again, thank you guys for having me here. And um, you know, if possible, I'll get started. I'll try and be as brief as possible to uh, allow for questions at the end. Uh, I am reporting to you from the Republic of Estonia, so I, I uh, excuse me if there are any technical difficulties. I am thousands of miles away. So um, once again, thank you for, for letting me uh, letting me present here. And if if possible, I'd love to move on to um, to the second slide. All right. So a little bit of history about Bike Keep. We are a global micro mobility micro mobility enabler. Uh, we've been around for eight years. Uh, I realize seven years 
was uh, was eclipsed in the end of May. So eight years, we are active in about 21 countries globally and with the common goal of promoting, promoting alternative transportation by making it as simple and convenient as possible for those to park their micromobility vehicles. I'm sure everyone has seen the shared fleet mobility vehicles of the birds and the limes. That is not what we focus on. We focus on the personal uh, mobility devices because that is truly where we believe the growth is, is to come. Um, so a, a brief overview of our product, we provide parking systems for bikes, for e-bikes, for e-scooters, all of which can be uh, accessed either through a, a mobile app or can be integrated into a local transit card. We can also add add-on services such as electric bike charging, which I know is a growing trend in many regions uh, that allows for more sustainable transportation options throughout the city. Uh, and moving forward, if I could go to the next slide. Uh, so here's a brief map um, of you know, some of the cities we're active in. Um, we are also active in New Zealand. That needs to be marked. But you know, moving forward, I can I can touch on some of these in more detail as I, as I progress. Um, so I'm sure I don't need to uh, promote to the Active Transportation Committee the the benefits of of having a cycle friendly cycle friendly city. Um, but obviously, from the administrative side of things, there are so many benefits to promoting more or I guess promoting less car congestion um, in the towns. I mean, obviously, as COVID has shown us, there are many issues with the way current infrastructure is um, in both you know, the U.S. and Canada. And there is a growing trend of um, kind of combating these with their micromobility phase. Um, obviously, you know, there are such great health benefits of becoming more active with your transit, but also in the in the grand scheme of congestion and how cities will look like in the future uh, when you imagine about the current car congestion issues that many cities, many cities are facing. And then you couple that with the growing trend of urban population that is expected to explode in the next 10 to 15 years, one can easily say, all right, well, the infrastructure in the last 60 years in the terms of cycling really hasn't changed uh, too much. And it, it is um, an interesting time to be able to look at this and say, what will our cities look like in the future and how can we combat the growing issues um, going forward? So I'll, I'll go to next slide here and, and get a little bit more into the detail. Um, next slide as well. Um, so uh, as you guys have uh, touched on in, in this meeting is one of the main issues a lot of these cities are seeing is the lack of bicycle paths. Obviously, you want to make it as safe as convenient and as um, secure for the cyclists to be able to transit around the city without worrying about you know, issues with cars, issue with, issues with congestions. But the second main issue um, that many of these cities are facing is the issue of car parking. I mean, in the past 50 to 60 years, um, you know, bike parking infrastructure really hasn't changed much um, in the terms of, you know, you, you supply a metal rack, the user supplies their, their parking lock, and then they lock it to either the rack or a telephone pole or whatever that may be. And it becomes a crime of opportunity uh, for the thieves. And that's really what bike theft really is. It's a crime of opportunity. And unfortunately, as this cycling becomes more and more popular, as do the costs of bicycles. I mean, some bicycles these days are upwards of five to six thousand dollars. That number can easily multiply when you add an electric charging component to it. So they are really becoming large scale investments for people to, to get around. Um, and what we are trying to do is basically eliminate the idea of bike theft um, in the cities we participate with. Um, we have both public and private partnerships, um, as I said, across the, uh, across the globe. And we are confident in saying that we have not had one bike stolen from, um, from our solutions. The only Asterix I put there is when a car actually ran into one of our stations and uh, there's not much we can, we can do about a, a, a Ford truck running into our station and then you know, hitting a bike. But essentially we wanna make bike theft a thing of the past. And we do this by making it as easy and convenient and as accessible to the public. Um, moving forward, if I could do next slide here. Um, so running through the, the Bike Keep Smart Dock, we have you know, three main products, the Smart Dock, the Scooter Station, and the Bike Locker, uh, focusing on the bike dock here, considering that it seems that you know, increasing bicycle traffic is really what we're focused on. Um, our, our bike docks, as, we, as I've mentioned, are, are the most secure on the market today. We have four layers of security. Um, as you can see, the, the orange bar here, this is actually at a fitness center in San Francisco. The orange bar here locks the front wheel and the frame of the bike. There is a um, a metering uh, wire that runs through the locking bar. So if there's any attempt of theft, like a, a saw or any sort of 
you know, hardware going in at some sort of tampering, there is a loudspeaker alarm that will immediately activate on the system. There is forward distress signaling. So when we um, partner with groups, for instance, at uh, you know, in the Bay Area Rapid Transit, where we have a partnership, if someone has any sort of tampering, then a forward distress signal is sent to the local security manager saying, hey, you know, something is going on at the station. Meanwhile, a four, a, a, an alarm is going off and, and um, to the bike thief, it's not as simple as it used to be uh, when it came to just bring uh, you know, a pair of clippers and, and clipping of a bike lock. Also, there is a security camera aspect, as you may be able to see here in the background of this picture, we have a security camera. The security camera is programmed. So anytime a session is started or is ended, there is a live screen snapshot, or if there's any sort of tampering that happens, we get a live feed on um, you know, what the situation is at the bike docks. This has actually been something we've used. Uh, there have been many crimes, not bike theft, thankfully, but there have been, um, you know, some sort of issue at, at a bike uh, a bike station. We've actually supplied our camera footage to uh, multiple you know, police investigations, which is another way of just ensuring security across the city. Um, and as I said, we do provide e-bike charging stations, which I'm not sure specifically in Halifax where you got, how you guys are seeing this trend, but um, in many of our you know, partnering cities, we are seeing a huge growth in electric bicycle use and Therefore, by adding an electric bike charging capability, we are ensuring to the user that, hey, not only are we accompanying your bicycle needs, but we're also going to provide you a service of charging your bike while you park, while you go grocery shopping, just to make it as convenient as possible and, and easy as possible for the user. Um, so moving forward, um, next slide. Um, as I said, so how it works, uh, we have a Bike Keep mobile app, which... Um, you know, it, it, as a simple registration, uh, one registers with name, last name, email address, phone number um, that allows for a certain connection between the user and the operator. We can also integrate with local transit cards, which is um, what we did with the Bay Area Rapid Transit. They have their Clipper cards, which is essentially their Metro cards. Um, and those the access has actually been integrated with those cards. So with your simple Metro card, with your simple bus card, you actually actually also get access to all these bike stations as well. And the reason being, as I keep repeating, is to make it as convenient as possible for those who want to use cycling as their main form of transit to have safe and secure parking options wherever they may be. Um, moving forward, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I can I can walk you through the the details of of the rack itself, but I'm more I'm happier to just kind of send over after this a, a more of a spec sheet data sheet if there's any more specific questions about the functionality of the station itself. Um, but essentially, with this station, it is delivered with a a 4G accessible controller that gives us access to the internet that allows us to be a mobile app based system, um, which. You know, as I keep saying, we want it to be accessible to all people, both um, those who are um, constantly on their phone and those who just have an RFID card and want to just simply park. Um, so uh, moving forward, please. Um, these are just two examples. As I said, we work with both public and private um, partnerships. And this is kind of a talking point that I would love to, you know, bring over to the next slide, which is about the Bike Keep Network and how I think this uh, would work overall in, in something in somewhere like Halifax. Um, yeah, so here, the, uh, taking a step back, our best case scenario, uh, no, our best use case, I would say, is in San Francisco and is in Tallinn, Estonia, which I, where I find myself now. And both of these are perfectly aligned in the sense that the first step towards creating this bicycle parking network was done by the municipality, was done by the local government. And um, what happened was, is they said, okay, we want a certain amount of stations. We want to provide these parking options across the city for our you know, our citizens make it free to use, make it as convenient as possible. And once those net, those initial stations were in place and the use started to grow, the private sector had a huge interest in starting to invest in these themselves. Because as you can imagine, it becomes way more of a wayfinding aspect, a destination-based aspect where, you know, local grocery marts, local shopping centers, local gyms in San Francisco were saying, well, hey, people are using this. Um, can we get one in front of our building so it makes it more convenient for the people who are coming to our location? Uh, so specifically here in Tallinn, uh, as you see, we have 62 locations, uh, about 600 plus uh, plus individual docks. 
but about only 20% of that was funded by the local municipality. And that 20% was the first 20%. And from there, it just immediately grew into a citywide network that was funded by you know, the local private players who wanted to just increase more accessibility to their site and therefore just became compounding off one another uh, until you know, cyclists are basically in charge of where the next station goes by just simply demand. I mean, what we're seeing here in Tallinn is uh, if you do not have one of these at your local grocery mart, then you're losing that entire chunk of business. So somewhere in a place like Halifax, where there's a huge demand to just promote all sorts of alternative transportation, this is how I see it, it potentially working um, and m moving forward if possible. Um, and, and, you know, there, as, a, as a kind of the general theme of this presentation, there are many reasons to promote more cycling aspects to a town, more secure aspects to a town. But I think the main being is the connection between the town and the user itself. Uh, I, I mentioned many times at the beginning of this presentation, but it seems like bicycle infrastructure as opposed to bike lanes really hasn't changed in the last 50 to 60 years. Uh, and this is kind of a way to say, hey, this cycling population um, really hasn't been attended to uh, in, in recent times. So this is a way for the city to kind of connect with the user and, and just show that there is more so of a demand driven solution coming forward. And then on top of that, uh, I understand that data is uh, sort of the, the buzzword of, of the last few years. There is, you know, the amount of data that needs to be collected to make decisions is extraordinary and you know rightfully so everyone wants data and analytics before moving forward everyone wants to know what sort of usage sites are getting and in the world of bicycling there's really no way to track how many cyclists are coming to your property how many um you know bike thefts are you having a year because bike theft is one of the least reported crimes in the world no least reported crimes in in crime um but what we offer uh, in addition to our services is a back-end system that allows one to track um, to provide monthly reports, to interact with the daily user on um, all their their needs and their requirements in the world of bicycling. So uh, in addition to you know what I have listed here, there, there are multiple, multiple ways to kind of leverage this information to promote future growth. Um, I mean, one thing we've seen uh, in the Bay of Rapid Transit is because certain uh, areas were identified as high population or high influx of bicycle commuters, um, there was actually a, a direct demand of, hey, now that we know that more commuters are traveling here, we know we need certain bike lanes in this area. So it's a way more interactive way to know what kind of numbers you're looking at, what kind of routes people are taking, and just to kind of reward those who are using alternative transportation. Uh, in, next slide, please. Um, installation uh, is... Uh, as simple as can be, we understand this is kind of a forward thinking idea, or kind of a new concept. So it wouldn't make any sense if it was a headache once you came on board. So um, to, essentially to get the stations online, it's um, just the station needs simple access to power. Um, as I said, the, the station itself is equipped with a controller that allows for 4G connection that connects it to the overall network. Um, the power itself is simply just to operate the, the locks. If you wanted to include a electric charging component, we strongly uh, recommend that there is a line power access. And this just means access to 24 volt power, which is your standard wall outlet. Um, however, if you know this is not as easy to do and you just kind of want to, to have an active station, maybe not with electric charging, we do have a solar power component that allows for the charging of the, or the, the operation of the entire station. But um, as I said, once, once there is simple access to power, it is simply plug and play. Um, Installation required, as you can see on the right here, this station is in one of the subway stations in, in the Bay Area Rapid Transit, and you can see they did not do any sort of ground installation. Um, there's an option we have, this being an example of adding ground plates, which allows for the user to really um, test out different locations without having to drill into the ground. Um, the standard installation is just simple wedge anchors that connects the, um, the bolted uh, dock to the ground itself. But as I said, depending on location, we understand that you know you don't want to drill into the ground until you know that there's actually going to be some traction there. Um, ongoing maintenance is uh, would be handled by, by by someone like Barry. Barry has been super super helpful to me uh, as being a, a local operator. Um, you know, Bike Keep we like to be this uh, infrastructure provider and we handle the backend software. 
But when it comes to being hands on on location to handle you know any sort of issues that may arise, while they they hardly ever do, it's nice to have someone more locally. And that's why Barry and I have been been in such great discussion. Um, and moving forward, please. Um, and as I said, uh, one of the, the greatest selling points for these is the access to the data um, by keep. You know, upon signature, uh, commits themselves to monthly reports that show data analytics, that show um, you know the the usage analytics, that show the demographics of the user. We can also add push notifications to the user, um, sort of requests for review, requests for um, some sort of um, recommendation for future locations. There's really truly a connection between the user and, and the system itself. Uh, we can also include. Uh, as I said, push notifications. So uh, to give a little bit of color on this, when we have sold to a certain residential mall or a, um, you know, a shopping center, uh, we've had clients say, hey, we want our users after their 10th time using Bike Keep to get a promo code so they get 10 to 50% off at XYZ. That's something we can easily integrate into our system. Um, and the, the point being so that the user really knows that, hey, we respect your commitment to alternative transportation. And here is a a, a reward for doing so. Um, and then another reason that, you know, the data being such a, a great part of it is um, that the abandoned bike issue of, uh, this is something that a lot of private corporations, private campuses are seeing, especially college campuses where abandoned bikes are just left there and there's no way to know who it belongs to. Um, what with Bike Keep, we, upon registration, need to not provide first name, last name, phone number, and email. So that, that way we can identify who this bike belongs to. It's way less of a clutter of a littering situation and way more of a, a service like, hey, um, you know, your park has been, your bike has been parked here for 72 hours. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> how, how can we, how can we, you know, fix the situation here? So it's a lot more communication between the cyclist and, and the city itself. Um, and, you know, that's, that's one of the great aspects of it as well. Um, and I believe that I'm coming up on the last slide here, which um, basically just gives, oh, you, you can skip this one as well. Um, basically just kind of gives a brief overview of, uh, one more as well, I'm sorry, um, of our, our scooter stations as well as, as you know, the, the shared mobility world, as I mentioned at the beginning of the Burj Dalan, it becomes more and more popular. We're starting to see that these companies really don't have a, a runway here, um, but they have, they have created that demand and that uh, interest in having these e-scooters as a form of transportation. So what we're seeing is more and more people are you know, getting rid of their bird membership and purchasing their own e-scooter. And what we want to provide is provide parking and charging options for those who are using those as their main mode of transport. So this is kind of um, our, our example of this. Um, everything runs on the same platform. So that's kind of the goal is we wanted to have one app where anyone can, you know, anyone who is in the area can access all their parking solutions and also charge and be sure that you know, other things will be taken care of. Um, also, the terms and conditions of each individual location would be set by the operator. Um, so if you want to say, hey, the, this is a short-term parking option, so you can't park for any more than 24 to 36 hours, that's something that can be absolutely implemented. There's a lot of flexibility in our platform. Um, we've been around for eight years, but uh, we still have some of the startup mentality in the sense that you know we, we like to work with our partners to see what their main goals are and how we can reach those. Um, the rest of the slides here are just simply, um, you know, images and examples of, of, you know, many of our implementations, kind of funny, funny ways that you can see what people have parked in our, our uh, parking stations as well. Uh, many people actually use our bike parking docks as scooter parking solutions. So that's kind of a one size fits all, you know, uh, response, but, um, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that may have come up. I can also provide uh, my, my contact information uh, or berries as well. Um, we're, we're very confident in where this is going. Um, you know, he, I find myself here in, in Talon out of demand, uh, but, uh, you know, this is a, a growing market and it's exciting to be part of a conversation such as this one where everyone is um, committed to the same end goal of promoting active transportation. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm happy to provide any follow-up information if necessary. Thank you, uh, Jones. Um, that's a very interesting uh, presentation. I'm sure there will be some questions and, and uh, comments. Um, just uh, my own comment is um, certainly I can see the need for, for, for a system like this in Halifax, but of course uh, it wouldn't be up to this committee to recommend a particular provi provider. Um, so, uh, you know, presumably 
uh, if if the municipality is interested in, in moving with a system like this, it would go out to tender, I suspect. Right. Uh, having said that, though, let's go through the speak the um, speaking list. Um, Councillor Kent, do you have questions or concerns? Thank you. I, I don't have questions. I'm very um, pleased to see this, have the opportunity to see this. And I, like you, Hugh, uh, kind of hover in my mind around um, the appropriate space to of which to give uh, um, knowledge to the municipal decision makers around this program. So my question, Lynn, uh, is it Jones? Do you go Jones, yes. Yeah, Jones. Uh, two last names, but yes, Jones. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's fine. Um, is ha I, I understand probably through the the name of this committee. This was this your first point of contact with the municipality, or have you reached out to our TPW folks to and, and, spe and specifically perhaps the transportation standing committee because this is the advisory committee to that standing committee of council where uh, education pieces, some presenters sometimes like, or sorry, presenters sometimes come with, with an opportunity to educate us about some things that are out there. Um, Hugh's right that any kind of uh, interest in the future, it should this be something that we were interested, would go through a public tender process and policy and the whole thing. But um, it would, be, I'm just wondering, have you reached out to any, anywhere other than here? Personally, uh, I have not. Um, I can I, I cannot speak for Barry. Barry's been a little bit more hands on with particularly this region. Um, I uh, I completely understand that there's a procurement process for these. I just um, found found this to be a good point to to introduce this to, to this committee. But personally, I have not had any more communication than this. Um, but I'm happy to be delegated elsewhere. Okay, so I, I'm just going to encourage you to reach out to the city clerk to to get the information about how you might want to do a presentation at Transportation Standing Committee. If, in fact, that's where they suggest, it might be that uh, staff might want to take a look at this as well. Uh, separately from that, um, I'm not going to pre predetermine what that next step would be, but um, this is this is one level, but not a decision making level. So no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, uh, I'll move on to Ashley Boas. No Ashley. comments really at this time. I just yeah, I wanted to clarify that it's essentially a bike locking system as opposed to like a bike, like sort of not rental, but like usership type space, yeah? Right, yeah, we, we try and provide the end user uh, parking solution. Uh, I know that bike rental has become very popular, but we try and stay as hands off as we can when it comes to operation and stuff like that. Yep, great. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, no questions. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Miles McCormick, questions or concerns? No. Thank you. No? Okay. No, thank you. Yeah. Okay. And Paul Berry. Nothing for me, Hugh. Thanks so much, Jones, for the presentation. That was very interesting. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Andrew Taylor. Nothing for me, thank you. Okay, Andrew. Uh, Milena, are you, uh, do you have questions or concerns? Um, I just, um, perhaps I missed this. Thank you, uh, Jones. Um, this sounds quite interesting. Is there a cost to the user, to the bike? Maybe I missed that. Yeah, no, that, that is, uh, that's a great question. That's something I actually did not cover. So that is completely dependent on, um, you know, what the operator wants to do. We have the easy capability to add a pay by the minute, pay by the hour, subscription based model. What we generally recommend though, is for it to be free to the user because that way it is as um, you know convenient and at a, as accessible as possible. Um, we have seen a lot of people initially launch the program as a pilot, as a free amenity. And then depending on what the traction is, add it at, at a, a fee-based model later on. But we have the flexibility within our platform to do both. Okay, and then, um, and there's two more quick questions. And so, um, because I cannot see, so how much room does this actually take up, let's say, against a shopping mall wall or what's, what's the capacity? Let's say for, you know, uh, three e-bikes, Mm -hmm. Four regular bikes, um, so on and so forth. Yeah, so um, now I can uh, to follow up. I'll, I'll provide a more accurate, you know, data sheet. But just as a 
of a general idea for um, a 10, uh, 10 station unit, a 10 station or 10 dock station. It's somewhere around uh, in about 770 meters. So uh, what, what would that be? That's, um, sorry, I'm trying to put my conversion hat on. Um, that's, that's okay, I can figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seven meters. Seven meters, right. yeah. Right. Okay, and, um, and then last, you said you're coming from Estonia? Yes, uh, oh. here in, in Tallinn, Estonia. And while it may look like it is, uh, it is sunny outside, it is 11.30 p.m. here, but it is the week of midsummer, which means that the sun sets at 11.45 and rises at 3 in the morning. So it's been a little interesting to, to get accustomed to that. But uh, yeah, definitely a, a different part of the world for sure. Right. Well, I'm, I'm originally from Lithuania. That's why I thought that's what I heard you say. Oh, wow. So, so, and, and I knew I'm like, you're really up really late. So thank you for your presentation. <laughs> no, I, I'm still <laughs> running on East Coast time. So it's, uh, it's easy for me. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you, Milena. Uh, Elizabeth Pugh, do you have questions or concerns? Elizabeth? No? Sorry, I couldn't find my button. Uh, no, I don't. I found that was a great presentation. I really think uh, it's a very interesting product. It'd be interesting to see if, uh, if there's an opportunity to test it here. Thanks. Thank you, thank Elizabeth. You, uh, Peter Simmer. Yes, um, thank you. Really, really interesting. Um, there's one kind of approach customers. We, I'm with the Halifax Cycling Coalition. We were called on by one of the business improvement districts to give them advice on installing parking racks, bike racks. Okay, so they, they had the question of, well, how do we do that? How many do we need? Uh, we told them they need far more than what they were thinking about. But uh, in a way, these are quasi-governmental mm -hmm. representing part of the city. And uh, they'd be, I'd say, somebody to approach, okay. maybe as a group of them, but individually, they're concerned at the very much street level of how do you develop this? Where, the, you know, and I was interested in your report of saying, well, the city did the seed money of, you know, that amounts to 20% of the total installations. Um, you know, so I think, you know, eventually grocery stores, will begin to buy into it. Uh, right now, as a cyclist, I look and I say, they generally install absolute crap for me to use <laughs> if I'm going shopping there. Yeah. Um, and it's a hard battle. And I'm amazed, delighted at this solution and the information you provided. Wishing you well. well thank you very much. Okay, Peter. Um, thank you. So, um, Alison Carlisle, do you have questions or concerns? I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, Alison. And Mohammed Esan? Mohammed? Mr. Chair, Mohammed is not in the meeting. Okay. Um, Douglas Wetmore, questions or concerns? Yeah, I just had one quick comment. Um, I noticed in the map where you were showing uh, cities and countries where you're currently active in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I noticed that you don't currently have any sort of, uh, you're not currently in any Canadian cities. Was that correct? So um, you're, you're correct in seeing that on the map. We actually have launched uh, or will be launching. I'm not sure how I can wear this, but in the next week or so we will be launching in vancouver with translink um okay, for for this similar similar situation citywide you know transit system uh that we are incorporating with yeah i was just curious if you had any other uh canadian cities that you were reaching out to or uh if there was any progress there no thank you very much yeah no, thank you thank douglas you. um i have one quick question or comment um mm -hmm. given our canadian weather um which is really messy and cold in the winter very often. Um, is there any uh, possibility of weather protection for these cycling docks? 
Um, right. So our, our operating temperature is, um, is from negative 35 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, we are very confident in our weather resistance. Uh, I remember when I first came on board a few years ago, I asked a similar question to my CEO. Um, and then he said, you need to come back to Estonia in the middle of winter and then ask if we're um, you know, ready for the, for the cold. So uh, to my knowledge, uh, that we shouldn't have any issue with any sort of weather, uh, you know, weather, you know, hindrance, uh, our most northern installation is actually in Iceland and we're down in Costa Rica as well. So a wide range of operating temperatures, whether it be humidity, whether it be, you know, strictly cold. So we are very confident in our solution. Okay. I actually, I was, I was thinking more of the protection from rain and snow for the bikes. Uh, oh, so for, that- oh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, if we, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we also provide smart lockers. If that's kind of the the um, the key point going forward is to protect the, the spike itself, then we do provide a more enclosed parking system that runs on the same platform, has all the same capabilities, um, but is a, a different product in the sense that you're paying for a lot more metal, right? I mean, it's a, a metal box rather than a metal locking arm. So if that becomes an issue, that is absolutely something that could be explored. Awesome. Okay, that's 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 good to know. Uh, okay, thank you very much then uh, for the presentation, and uh, I would encourage you to contact um, the transportation planning committee, um, and possibly also directly speak with staff, the active transportation staff, um, because I'm sure there will be interest. Absolutely, and and thank thank you once again, and um, thank you for allowing me to uh, participate. It's great to speak with like-minded individuals who, uh, uh, such as yourself. So I appreciate being able to, to join. Okay. Thank you very much then. All right, we'll move on to uh, our next item. Thank you. Um, and I'm just, where are we? Ah, reports, staff report. Um, I know we have a report coming up on uh, regional plan review, but David McIsaac, do you have uh, anything to report yourself? Uh, thanks, Hugh. Yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, uh, make the committee aware of a few things and ask your advice on a few things. Um, so I just, I'm going to post here in the, the chat just a few updated websites that we have on uh, related to mostly bicycling right now, but we're going to uh, work we're updating our, some of our pedestrian content as well. Um, so the first link is, is sort of some updated information on the All Ages and Abilities Bikeway Network in the Regional Centre. Just kind of gives a bit more of an overview. There's a, a map that, that you can kind of go around and kind of see the status of different projects. And uh, really, you know, we're, I guess, we have a bit more resources than we've had in the past to kind of work on these websites and, and improve them. And, and uh, we are, I like to think we're on the continuous improvement model. So anyway, if, if you look at those and can, and, and have any suggestions, we're very open to, um, to, to, uh, to, to, um, to those. Um, also, the second one there is the online bike map. So I think uh, that's sort of an online version of that hard copy map that that has been around for many years that has come together. Really, it's been a, a project that, that community members and probably earlier iterations of this committee uh, contributed to. And again, um, uh, have a look at that. Hopefully, it's it's helpful. And, and again, I think um, I think Ashley from this committee caught a little glitch on it uh, uh, a week or two ago that we were able to go in and fix. So um, anyway, that's there. And then the final link there is is a, a web page that we just recently kind of tweaked and updated on how to get around cycling um, to kind of align with the the get there by bike marketing campaign that that's out there right now. Um, and so that just has, you know, it has a link to the bike map and, and just a bit of information about bicycling in Halifax. And then at the bottom, there's links to um, some videos that uh, the Ecology Action Center uh, produced last year that are kind of intended for, for, for new bicyclists. So um, anyway, you've done a bit of work on those websites and, uh, and uh, would be interested in, you know, if any members of the committee wanted to have a look at those and, and give some feedback we would appreciate it. 
Um, just a couple of other items here. I think at the last committee meeting, we talked about the situation at uh, where the Chain of Lakes Trail crosses, uh, it's called Exit Zero from, from Highway 102. So um, I'm going to have uh, Phil Nickerson, who's the design engineer on the project, um, uh, is going to come to a future meeting here and, and kind of take you through some of the ideas that, that we have there to make it safer. Um, also, just uh, I know that uh, our traffic folks wrote and had a look at it, I think just last week, and uh, they're going to prioritize a couple things. Um, the, the pavement markings are horrible. So um, at the very least, those will be repainted as soon as possible. I think sometimes there's been some uncertainty whether it's the province's responsibility to repaint them or the municipalities. But um, uh, if the province isn't going to do it, we're going to do it. Um, I think he's going to see if he can get a, a, um, a, a sign at some of these kind of awkward intersections, we also put up a sign that, that directs uh, vehicles to yield to pedestrians if they're turning right. So um, it's just a sign, but it's, you know, it's an, an immediate improvement that, that can happen. And then uh, I think they noticed a few other little signage placement things that, that they're going to fix. So um, not a huge improvement, but at least, you know, doing some stuff uh, a little bit more quickly. Um, so that's just an update on on, on that. And um, again, I, I just alluded to it, but I'm not sure if folks, uh, I think this committee saw a presentation from Eliza Jackson last year on the Get There by Bike marketing campaign and what we were thinking about doing. So so that campaign is 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 now um, is now out there, and I'm not sure if, if folks have seen it. But uh, again, if, if you have and you have some thoughts on it, uh, uh, very open to that. First time we've ever kind of done that kind of a campaign. Um, uh, it's been interesting for the, the folks working on it and to kind of, it's been very social media heavy, but we think that's kind of helped because there's been kind of lots of discussion around it that, that, that's able to happen. Um, that way. And uh, and so far, our communications folks and Eliza and the company that's helping us with us kind of are, they're happy with how it's going. And, and in terms of, you know, the w what we're trying to get out of it. Um, I have lots of stuff I could talk about, but but those are some, uh, a few of the things that, that I wanted to, to bring to the committee's attention. And, and um, you know, as usual, happy to answer any questions here or, or Anything that that folks want to raise, just in by emailing me or whatever. Okay, so um, uh, rather than go through the whole speaking list, um, if anyone does have a question or, or a comment for David uh, right now, um, I would suggest you uh, speak or raise your hand. I'm jumping in uh, with my okay. digital raised hand. <laughs> Sorry, it's Ashley. <laughs> um, thanks, David. Um, great to see the Get There by Bike stuff up and uh, videos online. Very exciting. Um, we've actually had other municipalities contact us to um, share them because they said, oh, we were going to make some videos, but you've got great ones. So can we use yours? Awesome. I'm like, yes, yes, you can. Please do. Um, which is great. Um, I guess my feedback from the limited, I haven't been sort of trolling the comments like like some of my colleagues have, <laughs> um, seeing what where the discussion is going. But um, some aspects I think would be good to include in future iterations of, of this campaign is the like um, drawing attention to things like the one meter law and and I know it's like obviously encouraging people to to get out and biking, but just um, really hit home on on some of those things that that. Still, many, many people who drive don't seem to believe that these laws exist or they're kind of exempt from them. So a few like, not cautionary, but but awareness, um, I guess, things on that. And I just wanted to comment on the um, that intersection, the, the exit zero piece that um, I wonder if there would be consideration for the, the great blinding flashing lights that I've seen recently installed on um, Chibukta Road um, and the intersection. It's just past Oxford. It's the crossing that goes from um, Harvard over to the little convenience or over to the school. 
And just as a pedestrian, I go through there quite regularly. And I found that those very bright flashing lights when someone hits the pedestrian buzzer are far more eye-catching than the regular kind of round traffic style lights um, and, and any other signage. So I just kind of want to highlight that as a potential thing that would, would help the, the prevention of, of incidents at that particular intersection. Okay, I can, uh, I can bring that to the traffic folks. Thank you, that's all for me. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, any other questions or concerns for David? I do, I do. Yeah, okay, Miles. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation, David. Uh, and, and Ashley, uh, thanks for saying, because the flashing light, uh, strobe light kind of sign, uh, I saw, uh, I agree, that would really wake people up coming there. The other comment I have, David, if it could be brought back is uh, my observation about crosswalks, uh, too often they're trying to paint them before the children go back to school in September. Now's the time to start painting them because there's more people out and about right now. So that's an observation as a retired principal. Uh, crosswalks in my school area, they were trying to do them while the kids were actually literally going back to school. I think this is the time to do them and it does raise a bit of awareness of what's going on. So thanks. And uh, anything that you can do in that area would be much appreciated. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Miles. Um, anyone else uh, for David? Yeah, it's Paul Barry here. I mean, I guess maybe uh, I might have been meant to follow up with David, but I just want to double check uh, for the new uh, grants and funding programs uh, uh, under the administrative order for active transportation and recreation. I'd asked for a little bit of a breakdown of uh, what uh, had been applied for and what was granted. Um, do I? Do you want me to reach out to you directly about that, uh, David, or is that something that you? I don't know if other people might be uh, around the table might be interested in seeing those figures and numbers. Um, yeah, I mean, I might, it's going to see how fast you'll see how good I am at navigating our internal little file system here. Um, so we have, uh, I think as, as folks know, we, we, you know what, I'm going to do it at the next meeting. I will, um, I'll, uh, hopefully the clerk can be a double reminder for me besides my notebook, but, um, and even I'll get Emma, Emma, Emma's the person to do it. Um, Emma Martin works in our group and, uh, this was our first year of kind of a new grants program and, uh, and so funding community trails groups and also funding nonprofit groups who are implementing education and promotion programs. So. Um, some really cool projects, uh, and uh, some of the groups here uh, are, are, are receiving some funding for some cool projects as well. So, yeah, thanks, Paul. We'll, uh, that's a good item for, for the future meeting, for the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone else uh, with any, anything for David? Okay, then I think we should move forward. Uh, thank you, David, for your report. Uh, and we'll move on to the regional plan review themes and directions report. Um, I have down here on my agenda that there's a regional plan review team that we'll be presenting, but I don't have a name. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. My name is Kate Green. Okay. And Kate. I'll be delivering the presentation today. Mr. Chair, may I interrupt just for a moment as I have another meeting that I have to go to. I just want to check that there are no issues with forum. Uh, it's oh, uh, Haruka, I, I don't think there would be an issue with quorum, would there? No issue. Okay. You do Thank have you. I have seen this presentation. That's why I sort of thought, okay, I, I'm okay to, to leave. Yeah. But okay, good. Thank okay. you. Carry on. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Becky. Okay, bye bye. Okay, Kate, if you could proceed. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us here today. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a team of people working on this and where we're in the middle of uh, virtual meetings, I wanted to put our faces up on the screen for you. Uh, so a few of us are here today, Leah Perrin and Shiloh Gempton. And uh, we also wanna acknowledge the work within the organization that's occurred. This is a, a comprehensive 
plan that touches on a lot of people in our organization. So this is just a, a little thank you to them. So quick overview of our presentation. Uh, we'll run through why we're here today, how we're working with the public. Uh, we'll talk about uh, one of our big deliverables that uh, we're engaging on the theme of direction report. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we're thinking about regional growth and mobility. Um, so why we're here today, we're reviewing the regional plan, which means we're evaluating our land use policies and making sure that they represent the direction that council would like to, to set. We are, complement, we are contemplating how the municipality is physically organized and growing. And we kicked this phase of public engagement off on May 20th at Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee. That's the main committee of council that's advising us on the work. Um, and we're in the middle of a pretty uh, decent engagement period, which will end on July 16th. So just to take a quick step back to make sure everyone here understands the regional plan, it's a strategic document and it's really the first document adopted after amalgamation that provided a region-wide vision for land use. It was first adopted in 2006 and provided a comprehensive outline of how growth and development should take place until 2031. The regional plan is a pretty powerful tool in guiding our, the municipality's decision-making and planning as a high level policy document, it, it does a few different things. So first, uh, the plan provides policy direction for planning at the regional and community level. The regional plan sits above the community or secondary plan level documents and above all our land use bylaws. And it really sets region wide policy that directs how things should happen at those subordinate levels. Where the, something is important enough that it should apply everywhere, the regional plan policy can set up land use bylaw regulations that apply at the site level and apply region wide. So this has been done most often for environmental regulations. For example, the setbacks from water courses, the policies enabling that sit in the regional plan and then the regulations are the same and rolled out in every community's land use bylaw. The regional plan can also establish the municipality's intent to do future research programs or studies. For example, the 2006 regional plan called for a series of transportation priorities plans, including a road network plan, which ultimately became the integrated mobility plan. With its adoption, there is ongoing work and that all gets um, its own direction in the regional plan. And finally, where the regional plan identifies there are needs for different types of programming or partnership with community or other levels of government, we identify that in the document. Our mobility network is managed by different levels of government and can be supported through partnerships with other groups across our municipality. For example, the regional plan supports the Rural Transit Funding Program, which provides grants to community-based transit services in rural areas. So uh, this, photo presents the progression of the regional plan over the past 15 years. So on the left in 2006, we approved the original regional plan. And in 2014, we conducted our first review of that plan. You might recognize the name RP plus five, which was the brand for that review. And we are aiming to complete this review in 2022. We have lots of engagement programming planned for this month and we're consulting with committees of council, advisory committees and internal staff teams in addition to stakeholders in the broader public, which is part of why we're here today. Uh, the website is really our one st stop shop for all information on this plan review and you can see the website there. It is www.shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan. Our website has all the information uh, you would need on the regional plan. And we have some important dates here on this page that we just wanted to highlight. Our overall common period again is May 20th to July 16th. There is also a survey available. We encourage you to fill that out. It's running from June 3rd to July 16th. We are just finishing up a round of virtual presentations and question and answer sessions that occurred this week. They were on social policy, housing, climate change, environment, mobility, and long-range planning. 
those videos of those presentations and the questions asked are on our website as well. So to talk a little bit more about the theme and direction document, this is the document we're here to speak with you about today. It outlines the key ideas and planning issues that we'll address in the regional plan review. It's a chance to step back and ask everyone, do we have this right? Are we heading in the right direction? And the feedback we receive will help to focus our work during the review. There are 11 themes in that document and they're here on the page. We won't read those all off to you, but you, again, you can find out more about all the themes on our website. But today we'll be focusing on content from theme one and four. Theme one focuses on our role in enabling growth across the region and theme four focuses on mobility. The municipality recognizes that transportation and land use planning are inseparable and the decision-making process for both must be integrated. There are a few key questions we're trying to answer through this review. The first is, how do we locate housing and employment in smart strategic locations so that growth can happen easily and in a way that furthers the municipality's most important goals? And we can break this down into two questions. First, how are we growing? So what's the demand for housing and employment? We need to assess how we'll evolve in the future. And to do that, we rely on two key pieces of information, our housing and population analysis, which you can get in lots of detail on our website, and our industrial employment land analysis, which was a project we've undertaken with our partners in real estate over the past year to study supply of land. The second question we ask is where should we grow? What are the best places to locate growth? Once we know how much we're going to grow, we begin to assess where new housing and jobs can be accommodated. It isn't only about where there are pieces of land that can be developed, but where that land is located as it relates to the location of services and infrastructure. We can think about how and where we can infill or where we should expand the city into greenfield areas. This is done with careful consideration as to how development can be serviced with water, sewer, transit, recreation, and studying how we should be preserving or protecting important pieces of ecological or cultural land. And as Regional Council has identified aspirations for a sustainable future, such as the integrated mobility planned mode share targets and the emissions reduction targets in Halifax, we can update our modeling and assess how different land use growth scenarios might interact with these long-term objectives. The regional plan set growth targets for where new housing should be located. The 2014 regional plan identified that 75% of housing units should be located inside the regional center. So on the peninsula and inside the circumferential highway in Dartmouth and also within suburban communities. When we completed the foundational work for the center plan, it identified that we could accommodate about 40% of new growth inside the regional center. Following that, in 2017, the Integrated Mobility Plan looked in further detail at the growth targets and assessed our ability to meet our mode share targets, which aim to increase how often residents walk, cycle, roll, or take transit and decrease our reliance on private vehicles. The plan suggested that in order to meet our mode share targets, we need to locate as much growth as possible within the service boundary or within our suburban areas and regional center. So the IMP assumed that the center plan would meet its 40% target and that 50% growth would be achieved in suburban areas, which meant that only 10% of growth would be located in rural areas or outside the service boundary. And here on the right, you can see how we've performed against these growth targets in the past six years. So 31% of growth has been located in the regional center. 54% in suburban communities and 15% in rural communities. Now just to talk a little bit more about uh, the actions and the ideas that are contained in the theme and direction talk document related to mo mobility. The integrated mobility plan or IMP contains a region-wide vision for mobility and direct future investment in transportation demand management, transit, active transit, and the roadway network. The IMP represents a significant shift in our approach to transportation and the focus on the movement of people rather than vehicles is at the heart of the plan. Since the plan's adoption in 2017, a team of staff across municipal departments, including Dave and myself and others, 
have been working to move the IMP's actions forward. Our work on the regional plan will be instrumental in making sure that our region-wide policies for mobility are consistent with the plan and vice versa. We will update the transportation mobility chapter of the regional plan to reflect, reflect the policies and actions of the IMP and its regional approach to transportation planning. We'll also set policy intent in the regional plan for future work that we intend to do as the city grows. This will involve many different actions and I'll talk about a few of them in more detail on the following slides. Here you can see uh, one of the areas we're focused on is functional plans for multimodal corridors. We talked about the windmill road functional plan earlier tonight. Uh, so we know that some of the roads across the region have been identified as strategic multimodal corridors. These are important transportation connections for moving people and goods, be it by vehicle transit or active transportation, such as walking, using a mobility device or cycling. These corridors have been identified in the Moving Forward Together Plan, Active Transportation Priorities Plan, and the IMP, and were further refined in the Rapid Transit Strategy. We will update the regional plan policy to identify strategic multimodal corridors that connect communities. This means we will include policy direction to guide future functional plans for these corridors and direct land use along these corridors so that it supports our mobility, our mobility objectives. We will also set up study of land acquisition tools, which will help us in preserving and requiring, acquiring sorry, right of way lands for these investments in corridors and help in guiding land acquisition strategy. And as you're probably familiar in May 2020, Regional Council approved the rapid transit strategy, which aims to build a rapid transit network by 2030. This strategy builds on the vision of the integrated mobility plan again, aiming to improve sustainable transportation options and better support population growth. So, excuse me, it directs investment in high quality transit service and infrastructure, key to improving residents' mobility and building more sustainable, affordable communities. The proposed bus rapid transit network consists of four fixed bus route lines, which will provide all day service, including 10 minute frequency from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. BRT lines have fewer stops than local routes to reduce travel times. It'll improve the freedom of movement around the municipality, complementing local and express bus routes and increasing access to employment for many residents. The rapid transit strategy also proposes three new ferry routes, each connecting a new terminal to downtown Halifax. An announcement came out today. I don't know if anyone's seen that over the interweb, but uh, uh, the the federal government is investing money in a ferry running from Mill Cove to downtown Halifax. So we're starting to see this transit strategy be implemented, which is great. So to create sustainable transit oriented complete communities, the municipalities aligning land, aligning land use policy and rapid transit by planning for higher density mixed use development around existing and planned stations and terminals and working to ensure that affordable housing and amenities are available nearby. And we also want to improve local street connectivity and active transportation infrastructure as we, as we uh, change these corridors. So as I mentioned earlier, the regional plan and integrated mobility plan are identifying that we should direct most growth to where there are existing services. So to achieve the IMP's mode share targets, we know that we have to locate most housing and jobs where people can easily access the frequent transit network. So during the rapid transit strategy, we looked at the, so at the walk shed of about 800 meters um, with the expectation that people that live and work within 800 meters of a rapid transit stop would be, easy, would be able to easily access the network. And we explored how we can update our land use policy to encourage new, job, new housing and jobs to locate around the network. And we've continued this work during the regional plan review. So the map on this slide is a part of our scenario planning from our population and housing analysis. And it shows the BRT walk sheds and some preliminary ideas about how growth could happen in these areas. As we update our land use policies for our suburban areas, which are the areas outside of the regional center, but inside the urban transit service boundary, we will be working to make sure that most growth is aligned with the transit network. So it's great to have this direction to be able to really influence how we're going to be changing over the next number of years. 
Finally, momentous and social technological changes from virtual work to autonomous vehicles are transforming how people move around cities. So the long-term implications of these changes for transit and land use patterns are uncertain. We can't foresee, can't, uh, can't use our magic crystal balls. But in this context, we know that it's vital for a long-term vision for transit and for transportation to be established. Um, especially uh, to understand land use as travel behavior patterns continue to change. And we're also watching the impacts with COVID and, and making sure that we're talking to communities about how they think that will uh, change and affect their, their, um, the way that, they, that we live and work in our communities. So the regional plan review offers an opportunity to set up a future study of additional rapid, rapid transit corridors or areas that may, may be suitable for rapid transit expansion once the proposed network is implemented. And the regional plan review will establish a framework for this study and a visioning process for transportation beyond 2031. And accessibility is something that the regional plan has an important role to play. In. Uh, we want to work towards making HRM a city for people of all abilities, ages, and backgrounds. So when we've been talking about mobility across the region, accessibility has been a really important consideration. And our planning and development regulations address a wide range of physical accessibility issues, so such as access to buildings, the design of the buildings themselves, how our streets and sidewalks are organized, the location of barrier-free parking, signage, and wayfinding. There's lots of things that we influence through our development regulations. So our strategic planning can also support accessible active transportation routes and accessible taxi services and accessible transit by identifying these policy goals and objectives. Our planning policies can also support how we run our public engagement activities in an inclusive and accessible way and direct that we partner with community to learn from others' experiences and help to improve the work we do and the services we deliver. So through the regional plan review, we'll be reviewing our planning documents to make sure that they are aligned with the goal of bringing HRM closer to being a city for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. Uh, regional Council recently approved the accessibility strategy and the regional plan will support that work and the actions coming out of it. So we can set that up for our programming in the years ahead. So thank you so much for your time. Um, this is again, the, our website, as I read out before, our email is regionalplan at halifax.ca and our phone number is 902-233-2501. Please feel free to get in touch with us at any time. And we've been suggesting to the committees that we've been meeting with that you might want to submit a letter to us with your comments after the meeting or if individual committee members would like to submit comments, we'd welcome that as well. And any questions or comments that we hear from you today will become part of the public record as well. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to answering any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Uh, oh, are you hearing me okay? I'm still here, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a feedback. Um, so uh, thank you, Kate. And um, I imagine at this point in uh, this stage, you're primarily interested in uh, broad conceptual uh, issues rather than details. And in fact, the regional plan itself is is very much a broad document, as you said. Uh, and uh, detailed site planning and so on is is a different level of planning. Um, by the way, I was uh, I chaired the regional plan committee that uh, for the two thousand six uh, initial plan. So I'm very interested in this. Yes, um, I, I know your name, chair. So uh, <laughs> it's nice to be here presenting to uh, to you today. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's go through the speaking list and ask people if they have some broad, general uh, comments to make. And as you suggested, uh, if people want to get more specific and more detailed they can submit written uh, comments as well. Um, so Councillor Kent has left. So Ashley Boas, would you have any comments? Uh, no, nothing at this time. Thanks for the presentation, Kate. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Miles McCormick. No, not at this time, and thank you, Kate. Okay, Miles. Uh, Paul Berry. 
Yeah, I'd like to make uh, maybe a quick comment. It actually deals with what I tried to get onto the agenda earlier. So um, I'm part of RHRM Alliance with the Woodlands River Watershed Environmental Organization, part of the Halifax Regional Trails Association. And one of the things that we've endorsed recently is that uh, the regional plan review uh, consider um, implementing, or I don't even know how it would be, what it would be like exactly, but a community-based stewardship uh, program to ensure that the um, natural spaces, the wild spaces, the open spaces, the trees and stuff don't suffer too much from the human impact that we've seen uh, more and more impacting this. From an active transportation perspective, a lot of our active transportation corridors are in fact linear parks and they do suffer a lot of uh, kind of human impacts. And this can be bad things such as people having fires, chopping down trees, uh, leaving trash, you know, abusing uh, the natural assets that we have. Um, so we're, we've been reaching out and I had just wanted to link it as well to uh, Sam Austin, Councillor Sam Austin's recent motion at Council uh, looking for staff to provide a report on park stewardship. Uh, but our proposal goes further than that, saying that, you know, all um, uh, wild and natural spaces should be considered for stewardship. And the idea of that is that you harness the volunteer activity that is basically already happening by providing some kind of oversight, some kind of direction from the city. So I will be, and our groups will be uh, submitting uh, more and further information on that. And I think that's enough for now. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you for that. We've heard that, so we appreciate your um, energy around this. Okay, um, thank you, Paul. Um, Andrew Taylor? Nothing at this time, but I, I appreciate the focus on accessibility. Very good. Anything else? Okay, that's it. No, at this time, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Milena, do you have any comments or questions? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation, Kate. Um, I'm just going to repeat, as I repeat in, in several other committees, that I it would be of a much bigger, greater benefit and asset for HRM to send Shape Your City to all um, organizations that are uh, representing people with disabilities because um, as someone who's blind, there's only so much I can do in my contacts and I try and reach it out as far as I possibly can, but I feel HRM in general is, is still lacking and I hate to use the word failing, but <laughs> it, it's just not getting through to a lot of different individuals who live and reside in Nova Scotia, um, participate, pay taxes, and are the users of infrastructure and what exactly is happening. So they're coming down the line, but it, but they're, the, 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 you know, the, the lines are very narrow. So I really encourage every department, regional planning, every, you know, everything, everyone to send to all organizations so that everybody's aware of Shape Your City um, and what is actually going on. But a great presentation and thank you for your work. Um, end of thought. Thank you, Melina. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may just address Melina for a second. Uh, I, I am the chair of the Accessibility Advisory Committee and I echo your uh, sentiments and I will be comforting my questions and concerns as well as I possibly can. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> End of thought. Okay. All right. Thank you both. Um, Elizabeth Pugh, do you have questions or concerns? Nothing from me. Thank you. Okay. Very good. And Peter Zimmer? Yes. I'll speak briefly to one map you showed us, scenario B. I noticed there was a perimeter boundary where you map described a walk shed in terms of the transit. I really would like you to expand that and have a bike shed. Well, there should be a bike shed at the bus stop to keep the weather off, but if you are having express bus stops, it seems to me a logical choice for many people would be to ri ride their bike partway to a 
express bus stop and then get on the bus. Right now, the buses only can deal with two bikes at a time for the whole duration of their trip. Uh, you know, we're providing park and ride for cars out at the perimeter and they're very well subscribed to. I suspect if you provided the same kind of park and ride facility for cyclists, you would get a major uptick in both the use of bicycles and the use of the buses. And that should be on the maps to put that in people's minds as early as possible, as vividly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Peter. you for that comment. Yeah. yeah we, we, intermodal yeah. communication is really, uh, I saw a presentation once on that a long time ago and it really influenced me. So thank you for that comment and bringing it up. Yeah, I, I, I endorse that comment. <laughs> it's a huge. Um, Alison Carlisle, do you have questions or comments? No questions. Thank you, Alison. Mohammed Esan. Mohammed. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mohammed is not in the meeting. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, then Douglas Wetmore. Nothing from me today. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Um, that leaves me, and I do have a couple of questions, actually. Um, one is, will you be making that PowerPoint presentation available to the committee members, or is it already available online? Yes, my understanding is this will be circulated through the clerk's office to you. Um, and there's also presentations on mobility video recordings um, if you wanted to watch a presentation after after the fact. So you can find that on our website. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing uh, that I have a query, and that is what, what is the time horizon for this plan? Because uh, is it 20, 25 years or what? <laughs> That's an excellent question. So we we're thinking about that right now. Um, it was supposed to be just a quick update to the current plan, which has a time horizon of 2031. But given how fast we're growing and how much things are changing, we think we need to do a bigger update. Um, so we're talking about council with this. But one of the things we're thinking about doing is changing our horizon a little bit from being a time horizon to being a population horizon. So we might actually start planning for a million people and trying to work backwards from what that looks like. Our population projections have projected out to the year 2050. And in a moderate growth scenario, which reflects kind of the pace of growth and a little bit more that we're experiencing now, um, you know, we're, we'll, we're starting to get um, pretty high. And in a high growth scenario, we're up around uh, 900,000. So, it, you know, it could be, um, it's probably worth starting to get our infrastructure organized at that regional level because we need a lot of investment to keep up with the growth that's happening. Right, yes, better, better to plan for too many than for too few, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, one other quick question. Uh, is there a, uh, or have you, um, selected a peer group of similar cities across Canada with which to compare a, a, in terms of a sort of scorecard. Um, is there such a group? We have a group the municipality does of municipalities that we regularly compare ourselves to. Um, so there is a group that we, we sort of track against. Uh, we've also been watching what some of the larger cities have been doing um, one of the things we're concerned about is housing conditions right now. So we've been watching growth planning sort of across the country, uh, not, not just the cities that are similar sizes, but watching cities that are growing or experiencing growth challenges. So trying to understand that problem from a lot of different angles. Okay, thank you. Well, th those are my questions and um, we'll look forward to uh, seeing how it develops. I know this is a multi-year project uh, and uh, it's very important for the municipality. So uh, I'm sure our committee will be keeping tabs on it and uh, individual members of the committee will be submitting uh, their detailed thoughts, I imagine. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you for so, your time again. 
Okay, thank you. So um, that leaves us with the date of the next meeting, uh, which is set for July the, 8th, the 15th, um, Thursday, July 15th. So please mark your calendars for that and you'll be receiving a link. And finally, I contain the adjournment. All I require is a motion to adjourn from someone. Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Andrew. That is not, uh, no seconder is needed. So that concludes our meeting today. Uh, thank you very much.